All right. And we are live with two viewers so far. Um, what are we, we talking about? We'll wait a few minutes for some people to hop on. Um, but yes, yeah. I definitely need to see the beaches in the UK. So we saw one up north in the park, and it was like some seals were out there. I was like, this is scary. <laughs> they could attack. But yeah. apparently people saw them too. So, but yeah. Definitely. So we have about eight viewers. If anyone is out there watching and ready to comment and be our first commenter, please feel free. Say hello. Where are you watching from? And in the meantime, I will continue to banter with Michael <laughs> for like another two minutes um, before we get started. Normally there's like an address by the prime minister directly following every single episode I've done. And I don't think there's one tonight. And so we have Javel, the first commenter from Florida. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's one tonight. And there's another Floridian. Well, no, she's not a Floridian. She's in Florida. I have to say that correctly. But yeah, I don't think there's one. So, but I still will try to keep it 10 hour. I don't want to waste your time. So, let's go. No, if you go over an hour, it's fine. Alaska. Alaska. I. Don't listen. <laughs> sure, we'll get to Alaska. So we have from Bahamas, of course, at home. Um, definitely, I know recently someone asked me if I only do this for Bahamians and for people in the Bahamas. And I was, well, you know, we're sort of geared towards it. I think that a lot of the information, especially in this episode, can be used for more than just the Bahamas. So I definitely think that this is worth watching from anywhere in the world and yeah yeah definitely it could, anyone could use the info and it's going to be pretty useful so yeah yeah definitely and of course oh great there's no address today for the prime minister so it's two minutes past the hour i think it's a good time to welcome everyone this is season two of siren sundays guys we made it i did not even think i would finish season one especially doing a master's, but I did. And we are following a new direction. We are gonna be talking about things that anyone can use. We're gonna talk about sustainability still, of course, teaming up with the sustainable lifestyle. Um, follow them on Facebook, follow me on Instagram, follow them on Instagram too. And today's guest, Michael D. Boleg Jr., your full government name. And right, I want you so actually, and fun fact for everyone watching, we went to high school together. Yeah, we did. Yeah, and, Kingdue, Kingdue Academy. Right. And I feel like I had no idea interested in anything marine. And that sucks because it would have been nice to network from then. And But we're networking now and we're going to make it happen. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So definitely tell us who you are, what you're doing, and why are you doing aquaponics and aquaculture work? Yeah, so my name's uh, Michael Bolek. Um, currently a PhD candidate slash researcher at the University of Exeter in the UK. Um, and my research is pretty much focused on Caribbean spiny lobster, what we became in spelled crawfish, basically. And my whole research is focused on the overarching goal of it is how to facilitate aquaculture development um, in the Bahamas for lobster and then the, the wider Caribbean as a region in itself. And then there's some like smaller smaller goals like improving technology to actually get this aquaculture um, systems off the ground and transferring technology from other places to the Bahamas so we can get a lot more done than we have done in the past. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big good mix of different things um, that ultimately I want to use as a whole to um, just get aquaculture for lobster going in the Bahamas mostly. Um, a little bit of um, nutrition work, a little bit of immune system and function work and stuff like that. I won't get into like super details and that stuff, but that could get pretty boring. But um, yeah, it's a good mix of different stuff. Um, basically just to see what, what, what I can get done in my um, three, three and a half years for my PhD. Yeah. Nice. Do you think you'll finish in three and a half or do you think you'll go to four? <laughs> Um, and it's always like the challenge with PhDs over here. Three years, maybe four. Yeah, my supervisors seem pretty like, yeah, three, three and a half, 
for if you need. Um, but for now, we're going to go as hard as we can to get it done before the funding runs out. That's the, that's, that's the main thing. Yeah. That's the kicker. Yeah, definitely. So I wish you luck with that. I believe in you. I think you can do it. You have green blood. The Kings <laughs> with pink blood. So yeah, you have some work experience also in this field. Can you tell us about what is the work that you've done since graduating high school to now? How, how is what you've been doing kind of setting you up for this PhD in this architecture? Yeah, so the funny thing is coming out of high school, um, I know I wanted to do something in the science arena, um, aquaculture and aquaponics, not, wasn't that my alley initially. Actually, when I came out of high school, I wanted to do dentistry. Um, thank goodness I didn't. <laughs> well, you have great teeth, so that's I was, good. I was in bored on my mind right now. But um, yeah, starting at the College of the Bahamas, uh, now the University of the Bahamas, obviously. Um, did biochem for a bit. Um, was pretty bored, honestly. Um, they didn't re didn't really have what I wanted to do, um, but it exposed me to some areas of like the environmental and sustainability and all that stuff. So I kind of started reading more up on that stuff, and ultimately came across a program called the Small Island Sustainability Program. Um, and I focused on marine science and ecotourism under that program. Once I finished there, I went to the island school where I did like a short internship for about three months. And ultimately that turned into a aquaponics technician and then ultimately aquaponics manager there, like there for about three years, I think. And once I was done there, I went to Plymouth University in the UK, did my master's in sustainable aquaculture, came back home for a year, worked in aquaculture for a bit and did some other small bits. And then this, in January this year, I moved to the UK again to start the PhD. Yeah, so it's pretty much been my um my little journey from from high school to now, pretty much. Yeah. So definitely, I think you can always start talking about this boring topic because anyone who's viewing only wants to hear about this. And so yes, can you tell us what is aquaponics? If you had to give a definition of just aquaponics and aquaculture, and, and loosely talk about hydroponics, but that's actually what our next episode is about. What is it in like a snapshot, like sentence or two? So just quickly, aquaponics is essentially when you're combining hydroponics, which is hydroponics, you're just growing plants in a nutrient rich solution, basically, um, without soil. So just picture plants, roots, hanging in nutrient rich water, pulling nutrients from there. And you're combining that with aquaculture, which is the growing of any aquatic species or plants ultimately for food or stock enhancement. So when you marry those two together, you get aquaponics where you have a closed loop system where your primary producers for your fertilizer for your plants are gonna be fish that produce a waste product that gets broken down by naturally occurring microbes or bacteria that break that waste product from the fish down into a form that the plants can use it to grow. And ultimately um, those nutrients get goes back and it's like it's a closed loop it just pretty much constantly recirculates um and it's one of the most sustainable forms of food production um that you could actually use it utilizes about 90 percent less water than conventional agricultural um practices um you pretty much can't use any um pesticides that because they're pretty much going to be harmful for your fish mostly so that kind of also makes it a bit more sustainable than other practices. So yeah, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good little food production technique that you could use on multiple scales. It could be small just for like the backyard purposes, or it could be like full scale commercial production. So. And so you said a plant and a fish. Is it like any plant, or are there only key plants that you can use? And when it comes to the fish, like, is it only like a certain kind of fish that you can use this in? So it all, it all depends on what what system you're going to use currently the most most used systems are going to be freshwater ones obviously because plants the plants that you're going to grow in the system itself are usually going to be some form of um vegetables mostly so think leafy grains so like lettuce um herbs like basil mint oregano parsley um even fruiting stuff like tomatoes cucumbers peppers those stuff are what you mainly going to grow in your hydroponic unit in your aquaponic system and they obviously can't handle any high levels of salt so you're going to have a fresh water system mostly 
and that limits to pretty much to a lot of species that Bahamians don't like to eat. So you can have like tapia that Bahamians think it's not a real fish, which is really bad information. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the main species that you're going to use. So you could use pretty much any freshwater fish, catfish, tilapia. Some people use goldfish, not for eating purposes, obviously, but just to run their system and get the nutrients they need. And it's um, pretty. Yeah, and it's pretty, yeah. Some <laughs> people um, use aquaponics, um, freshwater species like koi. Um, obviously, you're not going to eat the koi. They're going to sell it on the market like as a niche, a niche product. But they can sell a koi and they can get their fruits and vegetables from the system as well. Now, um, a lot of salt water systems are, are like a hot research topic nowadays. Um, and they tend to try to use um, more tropic warm water species. Um, I think it's the University of Florida, University of Miami did a study where they use, I think, like snappers and stuff. And they pretty much tested to see how productive their systems were. And the plants they produced were stuff like sea purslane and some types of seaweed. Um, the system wasn't as productive as the freshwater ones, but obviously there needs to be a lot more research done to see how these systems could actually be facilitated to be as much, as productive as the freshwater ones. But the research right. freshwater ones have been going on for like for years now. So they're kind of a bit ahead of the curve. Yeah, the salt water ones are probably gonna catch up in the next 10 years maybe we'll see right, and then seaweed is that the one i know i recently saw an article talking about a seaweed that tastes like bacon is it those types of seaweeds like just those random kind or is that also limited i've never i haven't seen that article but a lot of the seaweeds were things you pretty much could find in in the tropics i know a big one was the sea moss that i know there's a lot of other caribbean islands that actually use sea moss to produce a whole heap of products from Fertilizers for farming for like a sea moss drink. Um, yeah. But there's a lot, there's a lot of bits and pieces you could actually do with it um, if you plan it well, obviously. Right. So how do you see something like this happening at home? Like, or are there people already doing this at home besides the island school? Because again, I feel like all I've ever heard about this was, oh, the island school, they're totally off the grid. So are there other places that are doing it? And can this? be something that's like a large scale industry for us in the Bahamas. Yeah, as far as you know, besides the island school system, there is um there's a guy out west. I sorry, I can't remember the name of his company. It's called Tom Stack. He he runs like a semi, I think almost fully commercial system, aquaponic system at this point, um, which is actually inside indoors inside a greenhouse. Um, so he's doing a, a lot of good things out there. In terms of other systems for aquaponics on a bigger scale in the Bahamas, um, I don't know of any, but I'm sure there's out there. I'm sure there's people in their backyards playing around with small scale systems or even bigger ones. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's, there's definitely people doing it out there. So that means there's, there's scope for more to be done. Um, right, I know many years ago, well not many, I'm not that old. I remember this guy approached me when I was traveling out and they recognized the logo on the shirt when I was working with the Bahamas National Trust. And he was like, hey, do you think that we can do aquaponic in the mangroves? Like if we just put a fence around the mangroves and use the nursery fish and just kind of do that there. Does that sound like very far? At the time I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I really don't think that, I don't know. I have no input on that. Do you think that's something that sounds very crazy? I mean, it's an interesting concept um, I don't think that would be considered pretty much aquaponics. At that point, you're looking at it, it's 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 kind of tricky if you try to use a mangrove to to pretty much for aquaponics. Yeah. You don't have you don't have the closed loop system that you you're pretty much going to want. Um, you could you could section fish off, but the nutrients in the water is still going to go where it wants to go. Right. So, so that's a bit a bit tricky um and then you don't kind of want to mess with mangroves when it comes to um for farming pretty much because they're so important they're so important pretty much for um a whole heap of things in the ecos in the marine ecosystem from being a nursery for small juvenile fish for breeding browns for fish as well and also obviously for um shoreline protection from hurricanes as well then you have carbon sequestration um, so they do a whole heap of stuff. So I would kind of steer away from doing any 
aquaculture work in, in, um, mangrove. Aqu in mangrove areas, yeah. And that's something that a lot of people have done in Asia with prawn farming. Um, and they've pretty much destroyed a lot of their mangroves. So yeah, I would stay away from that. Yeah. Right, so we do have a question. Um, I know you can see it on the screen. Is it possible to produce large amounts of vegetables or food using aquaponics? And would it work in countries that need to produce large amounts of food like India in terms of practicalities, cost, availability, electricity, and space? So is this something that can, I guess, be small scale but produce large amounts? Um, yeah, so that, that's that's a really good question. Could you pop the question up again on the screen? So I get to do one more time, yeah. Not a problem. Yeah, so, yeah this person's asking all the right questions. So. In, practicality that's a big thing like how feasible is it to actually do it do you have the market do you have the space do you have the technical ability and skill to actually get it done cost obviously um aquaponic systems tend to be a bit costly at the start so your startup costs because you're going to need a you need potentially you're gonna need tanks you're going to need grow beds for your plants some sort you're going to need a pump you're going to need some sort of air blower or oxygen provider for your plants and your fish. So you, you kind of have to factor in all these things um, to make your system work. Um, space is also an interesting question because a lot of people think that your space is just pretty much just right here. But with aquaponics, you could layer stuff on top of each other to utilize the, the vertical space pretty much. So that's that's one pretty cool thing about it. Um, and yeah, you could pretty much do it in, anywhere as long as you know what your plants or fish need and you provide that um, conducive environment. Yeah, that's it could, it could work pretty much anywhere. Nice. And so for people, and I, I think you mentioned earlier back to this whole thought of the small scale thing. How practical is it for someone to do this aquaponics thing in their backyard? Like, is this potentially something that someone can do for subsistence fishing? Like, they don't need to go commercial. They can just keep it small enough for them to just feed themselves and have some fish. Yeah, it's it's definitely something you can go small scale in your backyard. Obviously, you have to factor stuff in, like, electricity cost. Um, we as Bahamians, we know the issue with, with um, BPL and how <laughs> it's not that reliable. Um, yeah. So if you're going to do something like that where you have um, fish and you need to have some life support system in terms of like a pump or an air blower of some sort to keep the fish alive, you want to have some sort of backup power source. This could be in the form of some solar array with batteries to store the power when the power goes out, something like that. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the big things you want to have. There's other little really small tricks that you can do to kind of get around this um right I yeah think so I, I, would, I, would say, I would say having some form of backup would be the major the major thing if you're going to do any home system because you don't mm -hmm. want your power to go off for two three four or five hours and your fish have no form of no way of getting any sort of um aeration in the water to, for them to breathe so that that would be the big thing backup power and right. Besides that, there are like a lot of really small scale setups that are out there that people could even order from a company and just put the parts together. Or if you're a bit more um, DIY and want to do stuff yourself, you there's, there's plans where pretty much they tell you every piece of wood or pipe that you need and you could pretty much just build it yourself. Right. Um, yeah, and the FAO, the food and... Um, Agricultural organization has a really good aquaponics um, manual out there. Um, that if you Google it, you'll find it. It pretty much tells you pretty much everything that you need to do and everything you need to know, um, as well as small scale systems that you can actually build in your backyard. And yeah, so, and you can kind of scale that to your needs, basically, depending on like how much people you have in your family and how much people you want to feed. Um, with that said, being in the Bahamas, you're kind of going to be limited to, like I said, freshwater fish if you're going to do that. So that's going to be stuff like tilapia, like warm water freshwater fish. So it's going to be catfish, tilapia, um, paku if you could get it, or goldfish or koi. Um, right. I know Bahamians don't like tilapia. Um, I know the rumored, what are they? I think people say that tilapia doesn't have eyes or bones. It's a yeah, fake. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where they get these rumors from, but 
Tilapia, Nile tilapia, there's a lot of different um, variations, but the Nile tilapia originated in Africa in the River Nile, pretty much. So it's it's a real fish. It's not fake. <laughs> um, yeah. And a lot of countries, especially in Africa, they have a lot of tilapia production and in Egypt going on. And that's like one of the major sources of protein. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's it's a real fish. It's not <laughs> bad for you if it's grown properly. Yeah. Right. It's, all about, it's all about how it's grown. That's, that's the key. So, and on the topic of like fish farming, is that, because is, obviously we just take away the whole part of this and we think about the Bahamas or anyone else that might not want to just focus on these freshwater fish. Could this be something that we could apply just to have a solely like a fish farming system? Because I've seen things like, and I think what, salmon or freshwater, but I've seen, you know, fish farming operations with salmon. Is that something that you think people in the Bahamas could be interested in doing or starting? I mean, one of the ads had a picture of you holding a grouper, which I think might have made people think that I was alluding to the fact that we'd be talking about farming grouper, uh, which I hope worked to get people listening. But is that something that you think the Bahamas can start doing, like actually fish farming? So we could we could talk about a bit of a group, but that's no problem. But um, so fish farming in in general, you're pretty much the Bahamas in terms of scope and development for aquaculture for fish farming. It's immense. We have the climate. We have a ton of species that are pretty much um, viable for aquaculture purposes. Mm -hmm. um, we have the space, obviously, in terms of. Um, the ocean mass as well um and we also have we have i would say we have a decent amount of land mass if you wanted to go with land-based systems the only issues you're going to have is one a lot of people are kind of venturing away from sea-based cage farming to grow fish it's a big thing in the salmon industry for example in scotland in norway most of the fish production for salmon it's, it's going to be cage farming pretty much where you just pretty much a massive cage in the ocean um you stock it with fish you feed the fish the fish grow you harvest the fish essentially issues with that is a lot of waste pardon me the wild caught salmon uh, this documentary you talked about how they would release them from the cages and then let people catch them and then it was wild caught and i was just like what the heck but that's another but um yeah so you stock the cages with fish obviously you feed them um some for the fish fish feed and that fish feed is a whole nother topic we could talk about as well um then you harvest them when they're harvestable size obviously the issues you're going to have is and i'll use the salmon use salmon for example they um they're carnivorous fish so they they one on one feed that's pretty relatively high in protein so the problem with that is is that really high protein rich feed where you're getting that protein source from so generally um it's a bit better now, but in the past, a lot of that feed, that protein is kind of comes from wild caught fish. So pretty much a lot of fish that humans don't generally consume for majorly for consumption. Um, fish feed companies essentially would take that fish, process it, make it into fish meal and fish oil. And that goes into diets um, for carnivorous fish. And then kind of get fed to fish to grow, to grow them bigger, to feed the people who want to eat fish. So it's kind of, uh, a cycle that if you really think about it doesn't make much sense to taking fish to feed fish to feed people fish it <laughs> kind, of, kind of defeats the purpose so a lot of companies what they've been doing now is looking at plant-based protein sources um to feed these carnivorous fish so you have stuff like soybean meal alfalfa meal stuff like that um to replace these um fish oil and fish meal um ingredients in, in in fish feed to make it ideally more sustainable for fish the only problem with that is a lot of cannabis species can only take a certain level of plant-based products in their diet um before they get issues in their gut where they just pretty much can't absorb um the protein pretty much because they're carnivorous they're not they're not omnivorous or they're not plant they don't want to eat plants they're not vegan they're not vegan <laughs> so that, that creates issues on its own and there's a lot of a lot of stuff companies have been trying to do to like improve gut health for fish so they can take this plant-based sources so you have stuff like um prebiotics probiotics that feed companies actually put in fish feed um for the fish to be able to handle these plant-based sources better and also to boost their immune systems 
pretty much. But yeah, I kind of got off topic there. I'm um, talking about oh, that's fine. But, but just back to aquaculture in general for the Bahamas. Um, we have we have the space. We just have to figure out how we're going to do it right and what systems we would actually put in place to get these things done. Um, I would kind of steer away from cage-based, sea-based systems simply because a lot of that feed that gets fed to fish, um, stuff that they don't eat, it's going to drop to the bottom. And you could get um, anoxic zones and then you get like um, eutrophication, obviously, um, where you get dead zones. Kind of terms. <laughs> you got to start throwing out big words. Oh, sorry. Um, Anoxic and eutrophication. Yeah, so eutrophication is pretty much is when areas pretty much get deoxified because of stuff like fish feed, pretty much decaying and taking up all the oxygen, essentially. And mm -hmm. it pretty much affects the biodiversity of that area where the fish feed settling and waste, wasting away pretty much. That's mm -hmm. one issue you're going to have with cage-based sea farming. Um, a lot of people say to avoid that, obviously, is you're going to put the sea cage in an area where you get a lot of current and water flow to take all that feed away somewhere else. Mm. Um, the term is kind of like um, dilution. You're like diluting the issue and just hoping it goes away. The problem is you have no idea where it goes, what it affects downstream. Um, generally, a lot of companies are going to, sample the bottom of their cages to see how the the biodiversity the organism change depending on before and after the cage was there as a measure to see how how um detrimental the cage is actually on the environment that's usually how they test for it um but but like i said moving forward for sustainability purposes you want to have more land-based systems that uh give you more control of what you do with your waste products essentially Right. Rather, than just, rather than just floating out in the ocean and you have no idea what happens to it. The problem with that is for yeah, us... We're humans. We just let, it, just let it go into the ocean. It's, yeah. It'll go away. <laughs> yeah. The problem with that is for us um, in the Bahamas is land-based systems require high levels of skills and skill sets and technology and, and trying, to, trying to figure out how to get people in place to do all that stuff is a bit tricky. Um, there's definitely going to be, be need for like knowledge transfer from, from countries and people who are kind of far ahead in the land-based, um, aquaculture production area. Um, so that's, that's, that's the key. The species like, for example, stuff like, um, I'm trying to think of a species that people know a lot, like from Mai Mai, for example, um, there's, there's some countries that grow that on in cage farming purposes and it does pretty well. Um, and land-based systems and tanks, they don't do well. They pretty much don't do well at all. They're not, they're not that great in land-based tank systems um, because they're pelagic fish. They like yeah. open water. They like to move around. Um, you put them in a tank, they're a bit, um, yeah. Like yeah, sad. yeah, they don't like it. So that's, that's the thing, trying to find fish that do well in a tank on a land in a land-based system is also a challenge on its own. Um, and you mentioned grouper earlier. Um, everyone loves grouper. It's a great eating fish. It has a market. Um, if you could find a way to grow grouper, you won't have an issue selling it because people know it. It's not going to be a problem to sell. The problem is tr is trying to grow it. Grow it. That's the issue. Um, they're really slow growing. That's that's one issue. Also, their larval development is trying to get them from egg, a hatched egg, to all the way to harvestable size is a big challenge, um, especially for marine fish. Um, they, they, they just don't do well when you're trying to, trying to culture the larvae. So generally, if you, have a, if you have a spawn, essentially, so you, have grouper, you get grouper eggs from a, from, from a spawn set of fish. In terms of how many survive on hatching, for marine fish, people kind of gauge it at, if you get like 10 to 15 to 20% survival rate, that's deemed like acceptable and good. But that, that's how hard it is. When you compare it to species like tilapia or, or salmon, for example, where they get way higher um, hatch rates, um, successful hatch rates, about up to like 70, 80%. So that's, that's, that's the issue. Life is hard. <laughs> Yeah, marine, marine fish are just really hard to culture. 
um, really, really difficult. That's that's the big issue. But what and are those you, numbers in the wild, though? If if it's ten to fifteen percent accessible under you know those conditions, the wild isn't it also still very low when it comes to survival rate? Yeah, yeah. in the wild, in the wild, survival rate's a lot less. But the the thing is, that's just the thing about nature. In the wild, the fish can get essentially in that larval stage where they're still really young they can find the feed and pretty much all the nutrition that they need that's a big thing as well trying to figure out what are the right things to feed these really young fish at the right times that's a big thing as well um nutrition because if fish don't get what they need when they need it they tend to die at that really young vulnerable life stage so that's that's also another issue right um especially for grouper um and, and a lot of other species as well yeah. yeah i feel like we've started to talk about things that almost make people think well why why would we want to do aquaponics and aquaculture so yeah. maybe let's double back on that like what what would be some of the i guess reasons or advantages and i think we mentioned it earlier but just to again double back some advantages of, of people in the bahamas or anywhere in the world taking on this initiative of maybe either supporting places that do aquaponics and aquaculture or even do it themselves. And, and this obviously ties into the sustainability conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So just once one big reason why aquaculture is because I don't think a lot of people know it, but aquaculture is pretty much one of the fastest food production sectors globally. And aquaculture produced fish accounts for more than half like more than 50% of the fish consumed globally. So mm -hmm. most of the fish people eat around the globe are produced by aquaculture. They're not, they're not wild caught by fishermen or by boats or trawlers anymore. Aquaculture is actually producing these fish for people to eat. And pretty much global demand for seafood is going to continue to go up as the population increases, as um, wealth increases in certain areas. People want seafood and certain types of fish, seafood, the, kind of are deemed as, as I guess you could say fancy, like people want to eat lobster, people want to eat salmon, they want to eat these, these um, relatively, in most cases, costly types of seafood. Right. Uh, so that's, that's one of the big reasons out there is the market and it's the need for expansion, the need for areas to get into aquaculture because people want fish and people want shellfish. So there's, yeah people want it so you got to figure out how you're going to produce it um and another reason is it it kind of provides another alternative livelihood as well there's right. a lot of small small islands and small countries that um I'll, I'll use indonesia and vietnam for example they're pretty big on aquaculture um and they have done really well with in some respects they've done bad in others but for lobster um tropical lobster production um vietnam has done relatively well in terms of being able to um produce lobster they've they've encountered some challenges in terms of um feed um causing issues in the environment and also over harvesting the smaller lobster like pure life like they really tiny ones they've kind of over harvested in some areas but that's pretty much deemed down to bad governance and not controlling the industry itself before we decide to go ahead and just um and just do it you kind of have to have good governance and good measures and stuff in place to avoid issues like that that's a big thing um but a lot of people in these countries actually that's that's their way of life that's how they make money um and with as we see in the bahamas what covid what covid did basically it a lot of people don't have jobs or a lot yeah. of people are kind of on hold when it comes to jobs um because the tourism industry isn't stable obviously it's not something that you should you put all your eggs in the basket in obviously so um aquaculture which is in the food production sector that could be a pretty much a valuable um arena for people to get into because there's the market there you just have to figure out what you're going to produce how you're going to produce it how you're going to get your product to market um on time and at a good quality um and that just takes planning that takes um governance that takes measures being put in place where the rules and regulations support aquaculture and makes it easier to do business in the sector so it can be done you just have to figure out 
the best way to do it essentially. Right. So let's talk about lobster, AKA crawfish. And I know that's what you're studying. And I, not, I'm not, I hate saying that I recently learned this, but it wasn't too long ago when I had realized that the Bahamas actually has a really good um, commercial fishery for the spiny lobster. How do you think aquaculture and aquaponics and spiny lobster can maybe either help that fishing industry or change it? Like, what do you, you know, I think you understand where I'm kind of going with this. Like, do you think this is something that will almost kind of get some backlash maybe from these commercial fishermen or is it a way to kind of encourage, I don't know, is it better? Yeah, I, I think fisheries and aquaculture could work well together. I mean, obviously people can think it's like a clash of two different sectors. And if you don't plan it properly, it's, you're gonna have clashes. You're gonna have fishermen who are saying like, yeah, I don't want, I don't want people producing lobster because it kind of steps on my toes um, in terms of when it comes time to sell it. But the big thing about that is around pretty much everywhere in the world where lobster gets harvested extensively the global stocks and numbers have dropped and as well with, with almost any other large um crustacean or fin fish that gets harvested for food the, the stocks have been going down fish fish stocks have been going down for a while now and they've not caught up yet so yeah in the bahamas we have really good catch numbers um also the catch numbers are we have a lot of, of Oh, sea mass. So it's kind of tricky to know exactly how much is out there. So it's you don't just want to assume that oh, I had a really good catch this year. I had a really good catch the year after that. That the catch numbers are going to continue to go up. Um, especially when you see patterns from other markets and other places in the world, you want to have some form of um backup plan to help your industry in case your stocks do decline. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of good to plan ahead rather than just be reactionary after the fact. Which we're so, so good at in the Bahamas, yeah. right? We're just yeah. <laughs> so reactionary. Yeah, so that's where I think aquaculture comes into play. And crawfish, for example, um, it has a lot, it has this problem when it comes to larval cycle, trying to get that, when that egg hatches, you're trying to get that hatched um, lobster, per se, up to a harvestable size. Right. But there are ways where you could kind of bypass that stage and pretty much get the lobster at a point that's called its purely, which is pretty much. So I'll just I'll just talk about lobster site life cycle for, for a quick second. Yeah, yeah. So our lobster crawfish, once they hatch, the egg hatches. Um, and it's gonna hatch out just pretty much out in the open ocean, deep sea. You can picture that in your head. Once they hatch, you're gonna they're pretty much gonna just float around for a, a while. So peak peak um, breeding season is gonna usually be in the spring. Once they hatch, the, um, like I said, they float around for a bit and they're gonna float around for anywhere from eight to 12 months. And they're, they're growing at this time. They have a ton of different life stages while this is happen as well, happening as well. They're not, ju they're not just like, that one small lobster and just from that same thing, it's gonna continue to, to get bigger and have different life stages to it. And they reach a point where they wanna come closer into shore. And they're really good at swimming at this stage as well. So they kinda, they're really good swimmers at this stage and they kinda swim towards shore. And they look for areas that they could attach themselves to before they want to settle to the bottom of the ocean and become like a, a benthic organism at that point. And once they do that, that is a really good stage that you could actually harvest those lobsters and put them under some form of aquaculture production regime at that point. Because they're pretty much doing that stage where they're kind of floating around and then they want to go and settle obviously there's other things that they that wants to eat them they might they're going to get preyed on a lot a lot of them die because of that a lot of them also die because they don't get enough food they need so if you pretty much collect them before that point that they experience this the largest amount of mortalities due to something else eating them 
or they're just not getting to the point where they need to get and they don't get the food they want and they starve. You collect them before that point, you could potentially bypass the bottleneck um, and grow them from that stage up to up to harvestable size. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's what a lot of a lot of people have done in Asia with their lobster production. They get them at that point where they're most vulnerable in the wild, obviously, and they put them in better conditions. They provide nutrition and they grow them up to a large adult lobster, essentially. And then really or then just give them to the fishermen. Okay. <laughs> so when they get to harvestable size, is that when they release them back into the wild, or do they then just sell them in the market? So mostly they sell them in the mar- in the market. But if you want if you want to look at this from a stock enhancement point of right. view, where you can kind of have a positive relationship with fishermen that's saying, hey, I'm growing these lobsters at a certain size, and they put them back out there for you to catch them. Mm-hmm. Then that's that's something that's called stock enhancement that obviously can be done. Obviously, you want to do a lot of genetics to make sure you're not like um negatively impacting the gene pool by growing the lobsters and then putting them back in the wild obviously there's like a lot of work you have to do there but it's definitely it's it's possible it's feasible to be done right like, or you or you could just pretty much grow them up to marketable size and sell them sell them essentially and that's a lot of work a lot of work i'm going to be i'm going to be doing throughout my phd and trying to figure out um the best feeds to feed them um during this point obviously that's a big bottleneck as well um lobster nutrition and what they want to eat and trying to make it um relatively available so lobsters generally they eat they have a wide diet they eat stuff like shellfish um they eat other what whoa how did i not know this lobster eat other shellfish um yeah they do they they eat a lot of stuff pretty much yeah they're basically like how crabs are then yeah they eat a, they have a wide a wide diet yeah they also eat each other yeah they do um um so Trying to simulate that diet to feed them in the aquaculture setting, obviously, because um, you don't want you don't want any of your feed that you're going to feed your aquaculture organism or your lobster to be coming from the wild because it kind of defeats the whole purpose. It doesn't make your your um, production sustainable because you're using wild core organisms to feed your fish essentially. So you wanna you wanna make some um, diet. Like picture like a fish pellet that you would feed like your goldfish at home. That's essentially what you want to do. That pretty much has all the nutrition in that pellet that that animal would need to grow and grow healthy, essentially. So that's a lot of work I'm going to be doing, trying to figure out what are the best um, ingredients and stuff that need to go in these diets to actually feed lobsters so that they grow um, healthy, essentially, without issues. You're making lobster pellets? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's nice. Yeah. So if I can pick your brain, I have two quick questions about lobster. And I hope I don't put you on the spot with them. What would you say is the lobster's favorite food to eat in the wild? Favorite food to eat. I know. Like, hmm. I don't <laughs> know. You get a broad category as well. If you want to say like detritus or other shellfish. What do you think? Um, there was this research paper that came out. Um, Hit me with facts. There we go. <laughs> I'm trying to remember when it came out, but it was it was published by Nick Higgs. He's a Bahamian. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's he's a director at Island School, and his paper um, showed that um, lobsters. I can't remember the type of clam that they eat, but there's this type of clam that that makes up a big part of its diet. So I know they like clown for sure from his from his um his findings. Nice. So, so yeah. And so and I know one of my episodes in the last season uh, we talked about conch and a lot of people were actually fascinated that the conch does not switch shells, which believe it or not, people actually thought that the conch would you know jump into bigger shells when they get too big. Whereas lobster, they're a bit different. I know how, but if you can just start kind of telling them how does it go from being soft to then getting a shell and then growing with the shell. Yeah, so what lobster do is they molt. Mm -hmm. So pretty much when they get too big for their current shell, they pretty much force themselves out of their old shell. And and then their exoskeleton pretty much once they shed themselves with their old shell, their exoskeleton itself and the lobster's body is going to be really soft. 
and during that time they're really susceptible to being eaten by something else because they're, they're like really soft if you pick it up once they're molted you could squeak that you could basically press it because they're really really soft um so at that point what the lobster does is it rapidly uptakes calcium from the water around it to harden up the shell um and I'm actually going to do a lot of work with um, molting and calcification as well with, with lobster. Because um, obviously climate change affects how they molt, um, obviously. So, yeah, if anyone's interested, just, just Google molting. I mean, YouTube molting lobster and you'll be able to see actually how they do it. It's really cool, actually. Yeah. And I'm happy you said the magic words for our next section of this is the climate change factor, which is very real um, and it affects just about everything. So I was going to ask, like, you know, in the lens of climate change, how does aquaculture and aquaponics fit in it's beneficial? But I also found it interesting that it affects lobster malting. So if you can touch on how it affects lobster malting quickly and then shift back yeah. into how aquaponics and aquaculture could potentially be beneficial or not in the terms of like looking at climate change and the way that the world and even our country is kind of heading. I, I didn't hear the first part. First part yeah. is how is it affecting the malting is it making it slower like what is how is it affecting malting for wild lobster um good question i really can't fully say exactly how it affects it mostly but um if you're going to have that change in ph um it's basically going to make it harder for um calcifying organisms like lobster um to calcify faster because you're gonna have you're having a drop in pH where the water is basically becoming more um, acidic essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 I probably gonna make him harder harder to um to calcify. Yeah. Right. And so when it comes to aquaponics and aquaculture, is this something that you think would be even if it just makes a difference when it comes to things related to climate change and maybe helping make the country a bit greener? or you know decreasing carbon emissions like how how do you see this fitting into the bigger picture as trying to delay climate change or maybe even stop it well well one thing i think um any sector of food production and like we're talking about aquaculture and aquaponics is mm -hmm. um reducing food imports food imports has a big a big effect um, um when it comes to climate change you want to you want to produce your food as close to the close to the market as possible mm -hmm. where it can be consumed so for us i think if we can boost our um our food production from aquaculture and aquaponics um that could help us positively in that area um also uh a big thing with climate change is obviously hurricanes you're going to have an increase in the severity and probably the the number of hurricanes you're going to have um, per year because of climate change and having food production systems um, as a big important part of your country to produce your food um, limits how much you get affected by these storms. I mean, well, not how the storm affects you, but it limits how it affects your food supply right. if you're able to produce food like on like locally for, for people to eat um so i think i think those are two big areas where food production can help us in that area essentially. Yeah. and even in relation to the storms when it comes to like just our economy if we had this industry and things like COVID and the storm happen and we can no longer get tourists coming like we used to we still have something else to fall back on it's awful that 80 percent of our income is from people visiting us when things bad happen and we just we're I don't I even I almost cursed, sorry. <laughs> and we're just like screwed. But um yeah, uh, this has been great. Uh, we don't have too many questions. Either that means you've been very informative or people have no idea what we're talking about. I hope it's not over. Um, but if you could just maybe give thoughts, just thoughts for Bahamians about this topic and about maybe getting into this industry themselves and studying topics related to this. What would you say? How would you also inspire some young Bahamians to get into this? Um, I mean, my big selling point is going to be people need to eat. People are always going to need to eat. I'm sure everyone who's watching loves to eat. Like, so you're always, gonna, you're always going to have a job. 
ideally someone's always going to need to get some sort of food from you and that's for any food production sector not just aquaponics and aquaculture um you're always going to have a market to sell to once you produce a quality product and and it's fun like who doesn't want to grow fish or grow shellfish or grow some type of plant i think it's fun um another bit of bit of advice i would say if you're interested find someone who does something similar and reach out to them um yeah like for me me for example anyone interested in like what I, what um i'm studying or what i'm talking about um um shanti could drop my email address into the into the chat i guess and people can hit me up if they have any questions so yeah i think i think i think that's a big thing one you're always going to have some form of employment i feel like because people need food and two find someone that does something that you're interested in and and just try to get as much knowledge from them as possible just network as much as, as much as you can right i was just gonna, networking is so important and just to even like go back to what i was saying earlier in the episode i have to remember this is episode we went to high school together and granted you were on track for dentistry and i had always been, i was a mermaid trying to save the ocean it would have i don't know it might have been great if we had connected earlier but we're connected now and we can keep building the network it's definitely important i think for more bahamians to get involved in things related to the marine environment anyway um and other people who love to eat as we have a commenter saying <laughs> getting into this type of work would be beneficial for us and if even you can just touch on how hard would it be for someone to to get into doing aquaponics. I know earlier you had said you were a technician um, for a bit. Is that something that required you to get a degree? I know a lot of times people feel like when you want to get into these types of things, oh, you have to be super smart and you have to get these degrees and that degrees. But there are a lot of aspects in any topic I feel where you just need certain certifications to do things. Is that the same with this? Yeah, so for, um for aquaponics and aquaculture, it can be really technical, um, especially because in some in some instances you're going to be dealing with anything from knowing how to use PVC, how to plumb pipes together, um, how to hook up pumps, all that stuff. So it does have a lot of technical aspects to it. I wouldn't say you need a degree. Um, certifications in different areas from like plumbing, electrical, stuff like that are really helpful. Um, don't feel like you should shy away from the area just simply because you don't have a degree. Um, reading and self-taught is is a big thing. There's YouTube. Um, there's a ton of information <laughs> on there. Um, people who do this stuff and who are like actually um, backyard aquaculturists and aquaponic farmers are like they have pages. They have stuff where they put um, pretty much information on how to make things, how to do things. They do a lot of troubleshooting and stuff. So definitely don't need to, you don't need to like go to university or get a degree to actually build an aquaponics system or learn how to do aquaponics um right. it, it j degrees just make life a bit easier when it comes to like entering the workplace in terms of like building an aquaponics system no you could it's something that you could teach yourself um and troubleshoot yourself yeah right you don't, you don't have to go to school to do it now i was gonna say degrees don't make your life easier, at least not in the front end. On the back end, yes, a little easier. But like you said, you know, you don't have to shoot yourself off to school. And, and, you know, I mean, it's good. Get good grades in high school, guys. At the very minimum, try to finish high school. But it's so important to know that technical skills are so important, especially in sciences. Like when it comes to like collecting data, being scuba certified, and like he said, electrical work, plumbing, there, there are so many other aspects of this arena that are very easy to get into and end up actually even being very profitable. I've met a lot of classmates and a lot of people that I know that don't have degrees and they're not a broke graduate like myself, you know? So definitely remember that you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you have some other final thoughts maybe before we close out. Um, the last sentence maybe, like what would you, what would you leave the Bahamian people with? Um, <laughs> I would <laughs> put me on the spot there. Uh, oh, so the whole Bahamas or something. Um, maybe you will one day. <laughs> um, I would say just, just 
stay encouraged, follow your dreams, do what makes you happy, and think think a bit more about if you should get into the food production sector and area because it's it's something that's not going anywhere. Um, right. I know I know a lot a lot of times there's a stigma in the Bahamas when it comes to agriculture and farming and doing all this stuff. People don't want to get their hands dirty. They kind of want to go they want to go dressed up to work in a suit and nice shoes and stuff like that. Um, yeah, stuff's a bit overrated. I would say I would say just kind of kind of dabble a bit in in the sector because you might like it. You never know. And so we do have uh, one quick question. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. The nutritional benefits of fish has been tainted by the high heavy metals and other contaminants in the ocean. Does hydroponics or aquaponics make it easier to control this? And hydroponics is our next episode. Yeah, so if you're dealing with fish, yeah, it's gonna be aquaponics or some form of aquaculture. Mm -hmm. um, in land-based systems where you have, obviously you have more control of the environment where you're growing your fish it's you're gonna you're gonna have a lot less issues when it comes to um obviously being tainted with heavy metals and contaminants and so forth because your your production system you know exactly what's going into it you should know exactly what you're feeding your organism so yeah you're gonna have way more control over over contaminants for for sure compared to like when fish are just in the in the open ocean yeah Right. I know. I think the big thing is, was it mercury? And then, oh man, Cigatera? Am I saying that right? I don't even know if that's a metal yeah, one. Yeah, it's going to be mercury for, for like the bigger, bigger fish like tuna, swordfish and stuff like that. Yeah. And Cigatera poisoning, obviously, for stuff like, stuff like a uh, hogfish, grouper. Barracuda. <laughs> yeah. Barracuda, which is supposed to be the sweetest fish ever, but I don't, I don't taste the sweetness, but yeah. Um, I think the sweetest fish is the yellowfin mahara, the shads. Yeah. I had one of those, and I, it blew my mind. I feel like that's better than grouper. Grouper fans don't shoot me, but I was like, wow, this is a sweet fish. And I tested my life with this berry. I passed. I'm good. It's not that sweet. I totally agree. So, yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like there are any other questions. And if I could just get philosophical for a bit. It's funny, you know, and I thought about this somewhere in us talking. I always, whenever I try to give people advice, because I feel like I give great advice, I always like to tell people that are like kind of struggling through some rough patch in life, remember the, the crawfish. I always remember the lobster, you know. When they get uncomfortable, it means it's time to shed your old skin. And then when you do that, you have to then rebuild and be strong again and be bigger. And, and I thought about that when we talked about molting. I was like, oh, remember the lobster. So when you start getting uncomfortable, like in a workplace or in a particular situation, that uncomfortableness is sometimes what you need to grow. And remember the lobster, they can do it, we can do it too. So maybe, yeah. maybe you can take that on and that'll be some fun lobster advice that you can give someone one day, um, maybe. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty good advice, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that just helps you. That would be really fun to know, yeah. randomly. But yeah, um, that seems to be about it. For anyone listening now, our next episode will be on the fourth. <laughs> I'm about to get called out. The sweetest fish. Yes, yeah, dad snappers are also very sweet. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, October 4th, we will have Dr. Salima campbell Hobber talking about hydroponics and propagation. I am so looking forward to that talk. Just as how I was looking forward to this one, I feel like all these topics and all these guests are so amazing. So thank you so much, Michael. And I'm sure one day I'll be calling you Dr. Bowling. Are you excited for that? Yeah, it'll, it'll be nice. I don't want anyone to call me doctor, though. It's kind of weird. Yeah, I think I've met a lot of PhD people, and they're like, please don't. Don't call me doctor. I can sign with it. Please. My, regular, my regular name, yeah. Michael. I saw someone called you bro leg. Do you like that term? <laughs> bow leg? Bro leg. Was that Crystal? Of course. Yeah. I had to ask you. I was like, is that like a nickname? Or and she's like, Yeah, Sorry. she calls me bro leg all the time. Yeah. Kind of name for me. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. And I love that we actually we're gonna finish an hour and I don't see any other questions. And so I think I'm about to botch my own quote that I say at the end of every episode. People of the world, remember, 
it is not the ocean that separates us, but it's what connects us. And here's a Dr. Mike. So thank you so much for tuning in. This was the season premiere of Siren Sundays for season two. I hope to see you guys all here again next episode. Who knows, maybe we'll have Michael back. And that's a wrap. All right.